right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to everyone. I'm Brian Winklebauer, CEO of the Minds Foundation, member of the Minds Senior Leadership Team, and your host for our fourth State of Minds update call. Uh, once again, we have a wide variety of attendees, including alumni, donors, faculty and staff, students, volunteers, uh, some family members. We've got people all over the world joining us. That's the great thing about uh, this format. We have people um, who signed up uh, from Mexico, from Bangkok, from Spain. Um, our good buddy, Ben Fryer is on the call from Florida. We're, we're ore diggers from all over our gathering for this. So we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, as uh, important stakeholders, as you all are in this great university, um, we need stakeholders in order to meet the objectives of Minds at 150 and the vision, which is to leverage our exceptional past to position Minds to continue to solve tough problems for the next 150 years. And in order to be a top of mind, first choice, applied science and engineering university, we will need the support of time, talent and treasure, which is the premise for the campaign for Minds at 150. Minds needs advocates, champions and financial supporters. And if we're to continue to meet the demands of industry and society into the future, which is, as you all know, what Minds is known for. And so our, our goal with these calls is to bring you updates about Minds so you can stay informed, get engaged. You'll hear from several of our colleagues, each of whom will provide a brief overview from their areas of responsibility. Minds is so fortunate to have such incredible leadership and it's my privilege to introduce President Paul Johnson to kick us off. Paul. Well, thank you, Brian, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. It's exciting that you've uh, taken the time to tune in, listen to what's going on at Minds. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A part of things as, as well here tonight. Hey, it's, uh, it's week four, believe it or not, and uh, we're fully open. We're back to full in-person living learning. Um, all the normal extracurricular activities are going on. We have a full fall athletics program with nationally ranked teams and fans in the stands and um, our Vice President Dan Fox can tell us a little bit more about uh, how all that's happening uh, a little later in the program. There's a lot of energy and a, and a great feel on campus and our student trustee Connell is gonna give his perspective on that in a, in a little while. Uh, today's kind of a big day on campus, it's career fair day. And uh, it's, uh, at least for me, it's, it's, it's one of those sort of disorienting days because we don't recognize half the students because they're all dressed up in clothes that we never see them wearing. And then on top of that, we've got students who graduated in the last two, three, four, five years also wandering around campus again, back now as recruiters. And it, it just like, it completely throws you off uh, to see all those faces and everybody dressed that way. But uh, it's, it's uh, working out to be an incredibly successful career fair. We have uh, about 190 companies on campus today uh, doing an in-person format. We've, we've offered companies uh, the option of either uh, coming in doing their recruiting in person or do, using a virtual platform that we used last year. Uh, so 190 companies today, uh, more than 125 companies are gonna participate next week on our virtual platform. So collectively the turnout's really, really good. It's, it's uh, actually approaching what's pretty similar number for us for a fall uh, career fair. So we're pretty excited about that. So, uh, you know, you might've heard uh, that we started this semester welcoming the largest class ever in Minds history. Uh, that included about 1,450 first-year students and about 120 transfer students. Uh, for reference, that's about 250 more students than we were anticipating, uh, which um, is, a, is a, actually in some ways a very good problem to have these days with the number of students going to college declining and other universities not having um, uh, the success that we've, we've been having. Uh, it's an incredibly bright group, uh, just to give you some sense of that. The middle 50% of the students who have joined us had high school GPAs ranging from 3.8 to 4.0. That means that 25% of students had GPAs over 4.0. And what that also means is pretty much everybody that just joined us in that class is way, way smarter than I am. So 
uh, once, once again, a, a great group of students coming in. Uh, along with that group is the, the uh, most number of women in a first year class uh, and pretty significant percentage increases in students from underrepresented groups. So very diverse group, as well as a, a very academically accomplished uh, group. Fortunately for us, um, we welcomed the largest class in Minds history at the time when we welcomed probably the largest cohort of new faculty joining us. So we had about uh, a little over 30 new faculty joining us. Uh, they're all great teachers and researchers with the expertise that we need as we look towards the future. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about them from our Provost Rick Holtz in a few minutes. And um, in case you're trying to figure out the numbers, in total now we have about 5,500 undergraduate students at Mines, about 1,650 graduate students and about 350 faculty. Um, so all of you can maybe relate to whatever those numbers were when, when you were here at Mines or, or attached to it, but uh, my guess is they're probably bigger numbers than when you were here. And uh, in case you're keeping score uh, and comparing these numbers relative to our goals for Mines at 150, our strategic plan, uh, we now have about 7,100 total students, and that compares with about uh, a 7,500 student target goal. Um, currently, we're, we're looking to grow more of our uh, non-thesis students and students participating in our newly launched online uh, graduate programs and certificates. And we also have plans to, uh, to add about another 30 faculty. So over the next couple of years, you'll, you'll see some more growth um, here at Mines. And uh, speaking of the strategic plan, with a little over two years to go, we're, we're laser focused on all the things we need to accomplish by the time those fireworks go off and we celebrate our sesquicentennial in 2024. So uh, we, are, we are really looking forward to that. It is, um, I'm hoping everybody on this call is part of that celebration. And uh, just as a reminder, as Brian mentioned in the introduction, you know, our strategic plan is really focused on becoming top of mind and first choice. And that's to students, recruiters, industry, uh, government partners, and to anybody we're trying to recruit for a faculty and staff as well. You know, it's really important. As I mentioned earlier, the competition for top students is, is increasing. Uh, the number of students going to universities is declining. And uh, most universities, particularly the large ones, are trying to make up that difference by expanding their STEM programs. So everybody wants the students and the faculty and the staff that we want. So we've got to be top of mind and, and first choice. It's also really important because if you look at the, the challenges facing society and, and industry, um, all those things like energy, uh, infrastructure, security, uh, futuristic opportunities like deep space travel and quantum computing, those are all things that minds need to, minds needs to be at the forefront of and, and engaged in. If we're not top of mind and first choice, we, we're not gonna be involved in those discussions or that, that groundbreaking research that, that needs to take place. You know, I'd like to spend uh, uh, the whole evening telling you about Minds at 150, but I, I gotta leave some time for my, uh, my, my, my friends here on the call to also talk and to give you time to ask questions. But I did wanna focus on three things, give you updates on, on those. First of all, you know, in, in, in previous uh, State of Minds events, we've talked about uh, our strategic plan goal of making sure that we continue to produce distinctive graduates that have the qualities that, that industry is asking for. That means that we continue this, that we continue that rigorous fundamental and hands-on education that Minds has always been known for, but, but now we're adding to it and complementing it with, with business acumen and professional skills. Those things that are essential for the engineering careers of the, of the future. Uh, to support those goals, we've, we've formed our what's called our Pascal Center. It's, it's professional and scholar communities applied learning. Um, that's a center, and uh, that's combined with our uh, Viejo Irvin new professional development program. I, I noticed uh, Fran uh, on the list there, and, and I suspect uh, maybe Scott's listening as, as, as well. Um, but um, we're really excited to be launching those professional development opportunities and using the Scholars platform to deliver that so we can make sure that, um, that all, all students um, are connected to professional development opportunities across their whole time here at Mines. We're really excited, and that's getting off to a great start this, this semester. Um, second thing I want to mention is we, we also talked in the strategic plan about um, the need to realign our portfolio uh, of academic and research programs with the needs of the future and to diversify their delivery. Um, relevant to that, this fall, we've launched two new bachelor's degrees. Um, one's in 
quantitative biological engineering. I think it already has over 100 students in that program. Um, and, uh, and also a business engineering and management science degree program. So we're, we're uh, very excited about um, the launch of those. Again, uh, different applications of the, of the natural quantitative skills that our, our, uh, our students naturally have. Um, we've also launched a number of minings, uh, miners, including uh, ones in aerospace engineering, quantum engineering, and even space mining. And um, on top of that, we've, we've offered, we're, this is the first semester that we're launching uh, our new Grandy uh, Leadership by Design first year honors program. Uh, it's obviously focused on leadership as is the Grucox Scholars program that we launched uh, last fall. Again, uh, leadership was a big emphasis in the input everybody gave to the um, development of our strategic plan. We wanna make sure we're producing leaders for the future. Um, so that's all pretty exciting. And we've also started enrolling students in our new, uh, I think we have 30 plus new online graduate certificate programs, including the world's first online certificate in carbon capture utilization and storage. Obviously an area where, uh, where mines should uh, play a really key, really key role. Third thing I wanna talk about is the emphasis on producing entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, not everybody's going to go off and, and work for an established company. A lot of people want to take their ideas and their uh, creations and, and try to do something with those. So obviously, a lot of our alums um, have launched companies before, and, and we're starting to create uh, an ecosystem here on campus that, uh, that helps to prepare um, students and faculty for, for doing those types of things. Um, along with that, this year, there's a big emphasis on building out the Labriola Innovation Complex, that's uh, really key to accomplishing our entrepreneurship and innovation goals. That complex has four main components. There's McNeil Hall and the new um, team-based design class classrooms in McNeil Hall. That's been completed and we're gonna celebrate its uh, completion uh, during homecoming week and, uh, and thank Charlie and Judy McNeil for, for their gift that allowed that to happen. Uh, the Labriola Inoha building is the next one that's gonna get um, built. Uh, this is essentially a very, very large maker space. It's probably going to be the largest in the country in any engineering school. Uh, really doubling down on hands-on learning. Um, this is where project-based work is going to take place. The Thorson Capstone um, classroom and lab is going to be in that building. Uh, it, it is really going to be sort of the crown jewel of, of, uh, of the hands-on learning at, at, uh, at Mines. Um, there's also a shops area for um, large student project teams like SAE Formula One, the SpaceX Hyperloop team, the SCE Steel Bridge and Concrete Canoe. Um, they'll have spaces to do their projects now where they never had those before. And then the fourth building that, that's rolled into all this is the Venture Center. And this is where student and faculty innovations and ideas for new companies can be really turned into companies and marketable projects. And uh, our uh, Executive Vice President Kirsten Volpe is going to tell you about the status of those projects in a, in a few minutes. I, I would like to say that none of these things that I talked about would be possible without private support. And so I wanna thank all of you. And I, I, looking through the list of attendees, I notice a lot of, uh, a lot of our very strong uh, private supporters of mine. So I can tell you when, when I walk around campus and I, and I talk about the things that truly make mines distinctive from other universities, every one of those things has been enabled by donors and their support for the university. Um, with, without that, I think we would, we would we would probably just slowly evolve to kind of a generic school that isn't any different from any other uh, university out there. So uh, really cool thing is, is how many things have already been launched and been funded as a result of the campaign for Minds at 150. And if you haven't had a chance yet to be part of that, uh, I'm more than happy to come talk to you. And if you have been part and you wanna know the impact that your gift is having, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that as well. So as I wrap up, I just wanted to talk about a, a, a couple, of, um, couple of fun things. Um, you know, first of all, we did, uh, we did have the M climb this year and, uh, largest group of students ever going up to the M because we combined students from last year's class and, and this year's class. And I've got a, a photo of some of them behind me. I would, I would say from, uh, my experience, uh, walking up the hill with Provost Rick Holtz, um, probably more water was expended on this M climb than any other M climb in history. Um, much of it directed at us, I think, but, uh, we, we certainly had a lot of fun um, doing that. Uh, the, uh, the, the class, that very largest class ever, has uh, made its uh, mark in history with its M on the, on the field. Um, we've uh, also 
uh, this semester are seeing the deployment of the uh, largest deployment ever of Easy Mile autonomous electric shuttle vehicles. Those are those are here on campus. That's uh, over my shoulder here. Um, we're really excited about that. We're getting a lot of great press for that. Students are excited. There's three routes. Uh, they run up to Mines Park, down to the athletic complex, and down to downtown Golden. Um, if you don't have a chance to come visit campus and see the shuttle or see all the things that I've talked about, um, you're going to get a chance in uh, February to see Mines featured in a 30-minute episode of Amazon Prime's College Tour TV show. Um, and it's going to be a 30 minute episode just dedicated to Minds. We're really excited about that. And we'll be sure to send out an announcement so all of you can, can watch that when it happens. And uh, finally, I just want to say that the, the highlight of the semester so far for me has been uh, being involved in the selection of the new blaster for campus. I, you, some of you may have heard our, our old one retired this year. And so we had to have uh, tryouts and interviews. This included, obviously, uh, having to solve complex math problems, statics problems, and all those types of things, as well as uh, performance in front of camera and ability to, to stand for hours on end with selfies with uh, people who, uh, who love Blaster and um, obviously timing running down the field at the 50 yard line and back uh, without leaving anything on the field in the process. Uh, so it, it uh, was an incredibly uh, fun opportunity to uh, participate in that. And we, we ended up with, with two finalists that we kept. Um, this, is, this is our running blaster. Um, his, uh, his given name is Winky. And uh, our, uh, what's gonna be our paparazzi blaster. Uh, I don't have a photo of here to show you, but, uh, but, but his, name's, uh, his given name's Pepsi. And we're looking forward to, to both of them. Um, Blasters had the opportunity to run many, many times in the first two football games and uh, has done a great job uh, as well as Blue Key. And so we're excited with all those things happening on class. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to our provost, Dr. Rick Holtz. Thank you, President Johnson. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to say welcome to all of you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our two new deans. And so we'll put those up on the screen for you to see their pictures. Um, so on the, some of the things we've done over the last year <clears throat> is we now have our uh, 17 academic departments uh, grouped into two thematic areas. One is the earth and society programs and one is energy and materials programs. So Terry Hogue uh, started as Dean of the earth and society programs this uh, past year. And she oversees 10 academic departments. Uh, Terry was the department head of the civil and environmental engineering department prior to her appointment as dean. She served as the director of the hydrological science and engineering interdisciplinary graduate program and director of the ConocoPhillips West Center. She has been at mine since 2012. She came to us from UCLA, where she was an associate professor in the um, civil and environmental engineering department. Her research is primarily in watershed hydrology. <clears throat> focusing on the nexus of water, human, and ecosystem interactions. She recently completed a six-year term on the National Academy's Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate, and has served as the AGU Hydrology Section Secretary. She was also recently awarded the uh, Robert E. Horton Lectureship in Hydrology from the American Meteorological Society. So I encourage you all to um, hopefully meet Terry at some point in the future and get to know her and the work that's being done in her um, area. And then the second new Dean who was appointed this past spring is John Berger. <clears throat> John serves as the Dean of Energy and Materials Program. <clears throat> Excuse me, oversees seven departments. John was uh, the Associate Provost and Department Head for Mechanical Engineering prior to his appointment as Dean. He's been at mine since 1994 and had previous faculty appointments at University of Notre Dame and the University of Alaska. He spent five years on the staff of the Fracture and Deformation Division of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. John's primary research interests are in mechanical behavior and fracture materials, specifically as engaged in research concerning, concerning dynamic crack growth and crack arrest in brittle and ductile materials analytical and computational tools for analysis 
and angiotropic solids, elastic wave-based models, and the non-destructive evaluation, evaluation of syndically isotopic solids, discrete element models for fracture of rock, and numerical experimental studies of deformation and fracture in functionally graded materials. So as you can see, we have two very accomplished uh, academics in these positions who have uh, spent many hours and uh, time honing their leadership skills, very strong research uh, backgrounds, and are thus far doing just a tremendous job. So I'm really excited to welcome them into their new roles as uh, deans at the uh, at, um, mines. I also want to just let you know that both of them are engaged in the campaign for Mines at 150. Their primary efforts are to enhance the signature student experience and the pursuit of excellence and distinction. So as part of the uh, former initiative, this year they oversaw the hiring of 36 faculty uh, that we've added as President Johnson alluded to. 15 of those positions were tenured or tenure track faculty. And this past year, we um, did something a little bit different in the way we hire faculty. We searched for them in thematic areas that we term clusters. Those, those areas were advanced manufacturing and materials, electronic and quantum engineering, computational science and data analytics, and renewable energy systems. All four areas, areas that are central to uh, the top choice first of mind, uh, that uh, a topic that President Johnson mentioned earlier. So the general consensus among the faculty, I think, is that we have extremely high quality hires this year, which we're very excited about. And I'm also excited to report that more than 50% of our new faculty were women. Uh, we also added two department heads. So uh, Iris Bashar from Brown University will head the computer science department and Carl Frick from the University of Wyoming will uh, head the mechanical engineering department. The remaining 21 faculty were professors of practice uh, or teaching faculty. Uh, where again, we had more than 50% of our new hires in the teaching area as women. And some of the highlights are a new professor of practice in drilling in the petroleum engineering department, along with three professors of practice in business to help us support our uh, growth in uh, our BEMS program. So with that, I'm happy to hand it over to our executive vice president and chief financial officer, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Holtz. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit more detail on some of the um, capital projects that are going on on campus, as well as give a, a brief update on our, on our financial position. Um, as President Johnson mentioned, we've got a significant amount of focus in entrepreneurship and innovation, started by McNeil Hall and then following along with the Laboral Innovation Complex. Uh, that complex, um, the Innovation Hub itself, will be a little bit over 37,000 square feet. Uh, construction is going to begin in a couple months. We hope to start digging in November, go right through the winter. And uh, we project to be uh, done with that project with, um, with our grand opening in 2023. Um, and that, that project was really made um, possible um, by private donations. The majority of the funding that came uh, that's coming to resource that project is from private donors and, and their support of, of our strategic initiative. Um, and also the students provided support uh, for this building. So they took some of their fee money and really believe in our uh, entrepreneurship and innovation um, strategy at Mines and, and really wanted to, to make this, see this building move forward. Uh, the next one is a venture center, an entrepreneurial venture center, which is kind of the graduating point after uh, McNeil Hall and Labriola Innovation Complex. Um, that project will start in earnest in 22. The ground has been prepped. Um, we do think that project will be complete also in 2023, a little bit uh, further down the road than Labriola. Um, but that also is a, is a building that's a little bit above 31,000 square feet. It fronts right on Washington Street. So it's a real fantastic opportunity for us to connect with the community, with alumni, with our partners, students, faculty. Um, so uh, that's, that's a really exciting project. Uh, we're also looking at um, how are we making sure that we have the right support for students in terms of, of their housing options. When students come to school, um, housing is one of the biggest um, 
uh, elements of them making decision on where to go. And uh, so what we're doing is we're looking at a complete redevelopment of Mines Park. Many of you remember them as being, um, you know, just the general part apartment living on the west side of Sixth Avenue, but we really want to make it uh, a real sustainable residential village where um, students and graduate students, upperclassmen students can live, they can stay, recreate, dine, um, and really create um, something that is sustainable, that, uh, that has all the elements that what MIND stands for. So that's a really exciting project. We hope to almost double the number of beds up there. Um, and we're, uh, we're working with um, an innovative solution where we're working um, a creative way to, to really make sure that it's affordable for our students as we see rent in the Denver Metro Golden Area just skyrocket. One of our main goals for this project is to ensure um, that the students have uh, affordable rent. So we're, we're working with, uh, with some developers and we hope that we could see um, construction start in, in this coming summer in June of 22, another exciting project. Uh, we're also look, working with United States Geological Survey. We have for a couple of years uh, on a new uh, building on campus. They want to bring their minerals and energy resources divisions from the Lakewood Federal Center onto campus. Um, and thankfully, due to a lot of work by um, our Colorado Senator, Senator and, and Congressman, uh, we are in the infrastructure bill for $167 million for the federal government to fund this building. Um, so it has passed the Senate. We're waiting for it to pass the House and go through appropriations. Um, but once it does, we're looking forward to uh, working with the USGS uh, as well as our board to, to make this happen and make this something very unique for Colorado School of Mines. Um, as you heard the president say, uh, we are at an all-time high in enrollment. We are also at an all-time high in research activity. So we're looking on the horizon at our campus saying, you know, we need to take that next step of master planning and really relook at where we need to be um, in terms of our, our buildings because we really are accelerating the goals that we put forth in, in the strategic plan. Um, and from the financial perspective, we are in a good financial position. We weathered COVID quite well. Uh, we, were, we were quick to um, uh, cut costs. We were quick to really manage our operations. And um, we were really quick to uh, really be in a position where we can uh, maintain our financial stability. Um, and really that was due to, in, in, in many parts, is to the strong enrollment that we started to see last fall and what we're seeing again now in fundraising. Uh, through this pandemic, our private donors were fantastic and we had a record high fundraising year. And so all of that with us managing our costs, we really um, have been in, in a position of, of, of strong financial stability. So we're, we're really happy to, be able to continue through the strategic plan in that way. Um, so I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Dan Fox and he can talk a little bit more about uh, how are things going from our students' perspective. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Good evening, ore diggers. Um, I have so much good news to share and so little time to do so, so I'm gonna move along a bit rapidly. Uh, as you heard from the president, career day was today, and I just heard from my staff that we had over 3,000 participants in today's event. I was over there a couple of times, and you could just feel the excitement and the energy at the Student Rec Center, and it was, it was a great event today, so very happy with the turnout for that and, the, and how everything went. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we started the school year uh, with the ore digger camps. We had three sessions on campus this year, which is the first time we've had them on campus. And um, we had about 750 participants, um, which was about 115 more than last year and about 325 more than pre-COVID. So we've really continued to uh, uh, increase that, that uh, event net for, for all of our incoming class. Um, this year was a different curriculum in some ways, a wide variety of outings and activities, and we really wanted to showcase our campus. Um, so our students really had a good understanding of what the resources are, um, what the campus has to offer, and obviously provide a fun, 
team building experience um, while introducing them to all the great things our community has to offer on campus. That was really a successful way to kick off. And then as the president alluded to, we had uh, the M climb on Friday, August 20th. We had silver hats this year. You may not know, but the hard hats are each year we have a different color, um, which distinguishes the class uh, as the students enter each year. And so this year it was silver. They were pretty sharp. Had a lot of requests for those after the fact. Uh, we had about 75 clubs and organizations participate as well, and then uh, hundreds and hundreds of our staff uh, lining the street to send them off as they walked up. And we had about 1,600 total participants. We had to break the group up uh, to two 30-minute segments apart because it was just that big to get them all the way up the mountain um, to the M. So that was very exciting. And then just last Friday, we had our Celebrations of Mind event, the Minds event, which is our student clubs and organization fair where everybody can come out. We had over 200 organizations there in Spotsfield. It was, it was uh, completely uh, sold out and largest uh, Celebration of Minds event um, that we've had to date. So a lot of firsts this year in terms of largest events. And you know, before I go on, uh, I do want to send a special thank you to the alumni, the alumni board, all the volunteers for those events that I just talked about, as well as the other fall kickoff events and return events. I can personally attest um, from working these events side by side with alums and volunteer, volunteers that the student experience is truly enriched with your participation. So I hope you'll please consider being an active ore digger if you haven't before and you'll jump in on these types of activities and opportunities. I promise you, you won't regret that experience. And I know our students are enhanced. Their experience is enhanced as a result. We talk about uh, residence life and housing for this year as well. Our overall, our occupancy is about 2,220 students that are living in our mind student housing. That yet again is the highest number of students we have ever housed on our campus before. That's over 90% of our freshman class that came in this year. And I'm happy to say that we were able, Residence Life was able to offer housing to every student that applied to live on campus this year. So everyone that wanted to be on our campus is. Um, we also had record interest in terms of our theme learning communities. We had to move some of them, relocate some of them in order to accommodate that. So we have about 425 students that are in specific theme learning communities within our housing system. Another really exciting uh, launch that we did this year was uh, the Pascal Center, which is Professional and Scholar Community Applied Learning Center. Um, we did that for three reasons. One was to advance the minds at 50, 150 aspirations of an incredible student signature experience. We also wanted to advance the foundation's efforts to raise money for scholarship aid, thereby lowering fin the financial burden of mind students and increasing access to mind students. And finally, to proliferate professional development through the undergraduate experience. Um, there'll be many future opportunities for alumni and volunteers and donors to meaningfully engage with the Pascal Center. So we look forward to continuing to evolve that program and working with you um, to be able to make it the best experience we can. The president alluded to as well with athletics, we're off to a great start. Um, all of our fall sports are nationally ranked at this point in time. Two highlights I'd note from the weekend. Um, if football was uh, is now 2-0, and uh, we had a hard-fought win last weekend at Marv K um, and a lightning delay, so that was kind of exciting. Maybe some of you were there. Uh, we're on the road for the next two weeks. We play Fort Lewis next and then West Texas A&M. Um, and, you know, one interesting note, if you haven't come out, we really need you to come out and enjoy the games there because you create the, a true home field advantage. And there's just a wonderful atmosphere there. We haven't lost a game at home since 2016. So come on out and volleyball as well. Um, they're seven and one ranked 11th in the country. They won four matches over the weekend, um, culminating with a, a three to one uh, win over Washburn, which was the number four team in the country. Homecoming will be September 30th through October 3rd. We're playing Western State. We'll also have a women's soccer match. Unfortunately, our other teams are on the road that weekend. I hope you'll be able to come out and uh, enjoy homecoming. And we have our Hall of Fame and Athletics Auction uh, dinner that Saturday, October 6th, or 2nd, excuse me, at 6 p.m. Um, so uh, last things I wanted to mention very briefly was... Um, we have a newly created endeavor, which is called the Student Experience Fund. It's a new initiative, which is uh, hopefully making a well-rounded education even more robust and possible for our students. It's part of the Minds at 150 initiative in student life. Um, and it enriches just a myriad of student support services 
so all diggers can succeed. We've had recent folks contribute in, in various ways that um, I hope that you'll, if that draws interest to you, you'll continue to look at that. We've also can't stop thanking people enough for helping with the student emergency fund. We do still continue to see lots of need there. Examples of recent funding, um, you know, unfortunately we've had students, as you know, coming from all over the states, We've had ongoing wildfires this year and hurricanes, floods and tornadoes. Um, and we've been able to supplement some of those student needs uh, on a base level to keep them in school, keep them learning um, and keep them progressing so they can go out and do incredible things. Last thing I'd mentioned too, is we've been hard at work in student life. We formulated three teams for our elements of living and learning um, in the Minds at 150 plan. So we have a residential campus um, prong. We have a student well-being and wellness prong, and then we have a community scholars and professional development prong. So those that's the news I have right now. I hope that wasn't too fast and furious. i um, happy to take questions as we move. I want to, um, very excited to introduce Connell now, who is our student body representative to the board of trustees, to talk a little bit about himself and his experience. So I'll turn it over to you, Colin, Connell. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox, and thank you so much, alumni, for joining us tonight. Um, as Dr. Fox mentioned, my name is Connell Saxena. I'm a senior mechanical engineer, and uh, my duty is to represent the student body to the Board of Trustees. Um, I just really wanted to talk about how I came to Minds, first of all. So I knew I wanted to pursue a degree with some sort of aerospace in mind, but I also wanted to come to Minds. And at the time, I didn't know too much about engineering. And so I was willing to come to Minds as a civil engineer. It wasn't until after I started to learn more about mechanical engineering that I realized that I could pursue my industry goal while also attending mines. And uh, what a good decision that was, um, because I cannot describe just how much I've learned and grown as a person these past three years. Besides school, um, I'm really involved in the undergraduate student government, but I also climb, run, and ski. Those things keep me grounded while studying. If I was to give a pulse for the student body as a whole this upcoming semester, I would just have to say excitement. Um, it is really refreshing to see minds blossoming with a 100% in-person delivery and student events effectively in full swing again. Um, I just want to point out that a lot of professors have their lectures available online for students to view, and yet you still see classes filled with students wanting that face-to-face -face interaction. And I think it speaks volumes to just the student resilience and the desire to learn. Today, as Dr. Fox and PCJ mentioned, was career day. And from the student's perspective, it was just really energizing to see everyone engaging with employers. Um, I haven't seen it in two years like that, obviously. And if you didn't know that there was a virtual career fair next week, you would probably assume that this was the biggest career fair because that's what it felt like to me. Um, lastly, I just wanted to quickly talk um, to the alumni that are in the call. Um, I wanted to just say that mine students really do value your advice, especially when it comes to industry. I myself am getting ready to hopefully graduate here in the springtime, and I would really value some of your advice as I enter into industry, um, specifically like Things that you wish you knew as you entered industry would be great for students to hear who are graduating. And I'm sure a lot of students would happily utilize it. And lastly, just kind of going a little bit off topic here. Last week at the board meeting, uh, Trustee Bruce Grucock brought up a great point about continuing to inform political figures about our lovely campus here at Mines. And I just wanted to further extend that and challenge alumni to continue talking to their, about their alma mater to anyone in industry that they possibly can. And by doing so, Minds will have the opportunity to expand its appearance to the rest of the country, uh, publicly, politically, academically, to students, pol political figures, and uh, families around the country. And I think that's all I have really to say. So I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A directed at me. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Connell. Really appreciate your insights. Uh, as everyone can see, Connell's a, a terrific Board of Trustee representative um, of the student body and uh, appreciate um, always um, the perspective of students. So we've got uh, some time for questions and we'll do our best, as I mentioned in the, in the chat, to uh, try to address as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, uh, we will endeavor to reach back out to you individually 
um, with an answer to the question. Uh, several of you had, have asked about specific uh, demographic information, and I think we can um, collect that information and get it back to you um, at, a, at a later time. Um, so again, if you've got a question, go ahead and, and send it into the Q&A feature. Um, appreciate all of uh, my colleagues and their, um, their overviews, obviously a lot going on. Um, maybe to, to start, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, the, some of the new programs, uh, new initiatives that uh, many of you mentioned. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of um, questions about uh, current events, um, whether it's uh, the, um, the, the position of fossil fuels in the, in the energy future or water or um, you know, AI, um, the, the quantitative bio uh, program has, has come online to, to address some specific needs. So as MINES continues to be that go-to place for industry and solving challenges for uh, society, um, I wondered if, if Paul, maybe you might um, uh, answer some of the questions about um, where is MINES positioned to tackle some of these uh, challenges right now that are, that are in the news? Sure. Th thanks, Brian. I'll be I'll be happy to. Yeah, it's it's uh, sometimes it's difficult to watch the news <laughs> because uh, you know de depending on what your source of information is, there's there's obviously pretty extreme spins being put on things and and um, uh, you know probably very unrealistic expectations for what the near future is going to look like uh, in, in our country or in our state. But I will say, you know, getting back to our mission, you know, what Mines has always done really really well is we've always focused on producing the scientists and engineers and the knowledge and the innovations that industry and society need at, at whatever time that, that's happened. And it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that um, what those topics are these, these days, you know? So whether you're, without getting into the details of what people are talking about, obviously energy is a huge to topic and obviously um, the, the the sources of our energy in the future are, are huge topics um, that are out there. As Brian has said, water resources, um, uh, all sorts of other things uh, that that really mine should be should be great at. And so we we do sort of keep an eye on things. We listen to our industry contacts, and we we try to sort of identify. Okay, we're, what's the what's the core issue here in the midst of this discussion, and and how can mines play a role in that? So for just as an example. In the uh, you know the energy future space, uh, which you know obviously the debate is uh, you know can can we move from a you know kind of a hydrocarbon based energy uh, system to one that that relies more on or entirely on on renewables right that's that's kind of the debate that's taking place so we we have something called our global energy futures initiative uh, this initiative involves. I can't remember exactly how many faculty across campus, but I think it's a number that's that's probably close to 60 or 70 uh, faculty across campus with very unique expertise and involves our, our Payne Institute for, for, um, for policy initiatives. And, um, and so we're, we're bringing our expertise to bear because if you just look at that topic, right, there are so many dimensions to it. There's, there's obviously, as we mentioned, we're, we're launching the world's first online um, certificate program in carbon capture utilization sequestration, right? Um, that, that's that's part of that initiative. We've we've got um, uh, you know people who are who are experts in how do we reduce emissions while we're producing hydrocarbons. We've got people that are looking at well, what's really needed to go to a more renewables future. I mean, there's a lot of other natural resources that have to be mined for that to happen. So, um, so we've got this uh, gr great initiative. If you're interested in that topic, which is obviously a very fascinating one and one that Mines is clearly going to play a big role in, uh, I would invite you to go go to our website and look up Global Energy Future Initiatives or GEFI, as we tend to call it, um, and you'll see that uh, we've got a lot of things going on there, from research to hosting speakers to uh, a lot of other things. I can draw analogies to the to the water area as well. You know, we've got great expertise at mines in the water area. We've, uh, you might have seen in the news recently, um, some of our faculty have developed this mobile water treatment unit that can go and, and experiment with the latest technologies on very different kinds of source waters. Um, very unique facility here at campus. So 
Brian, I just just to wrap up the question, I would say we're we are always, you know, we're sort of paying attention to what discussions going on, but really, it comes down to talking to our industry partners and figuring out what the core issue is that mines can be part of and trying not to get too caught up in the, you know, the extreme dialogue that takes place in the news, but but uh, really figure that spot where mines can play a role and go for it. Thanks, Paul. And uh, Jim White asked, uh, is engineering still the focus? Absolutely, Jim. <laughs> Everything we do at Mines is about engineering and, and applied sciences, of course. We have terrific programs across the board. And in fact, uh, you'll note that uh, um, either Rick or, or Paul mentioned our business engineering management science program. It's got the word engineering and science in it. And uh, there, it's a quantitative program. And so, yes, um, as, as Paul mentioned, MINDS needs to be part of these conversations, uh, these uh, new challenges of the future. Um, with our legacy and history, uh, we are well positioned to um, be a leader um, in tackling some of these tough problems. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, some, some questions about um, how, do we, how do we continue to um, find these great students like Connell? Um, what, are, uh, what are the efforts we're undertaking to, um, uh, to bring on these great students? Obviously, alumni have, have uh, set the foundation for um, the, the quality uh, um, of kind of students that come to minds. Um, what are we doing to uh, develop the, these tremendous uh, student bodies going forward? And, and maybe Paul and Rick, uh, you both could could address that. Sure. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start first, and then I'll, I'll ask Rick to add in because um, Rick Rick oversees the admission the admissions part of the world here at at, at Mines. So I, I will say, you know, just in in brief, Brian, um, you know, our Mines at 150 strategic plan is all about that issue. It's, it's all about being competitive to continue to attract the best students. And there's so many, there's so many aspects to that. I mean, obviously you have to be, as an institution, you've, you've, you've got to be attractive and accessible, right? Accessible has a financial component to it. Attractive means, you know, students have to look at minds and go, okay, well, if I go there, uh, am I going to get a degree? Am I going to get a job? Am I going to, you know, be trained better than any other school? And, and obviously those things are, are, are very important to us. Having a Producing a graduate that's, that's distinctively different from other institutions is very important to us, uh, as Mines has, has always done and, and needs to continue um, to, to do that as well, relative to what the what the needs are for the future. Um, uh, you know, we talked about broadening our portfolio and delivery and everything like that. So every component, including the engagement of the alumni, is is a key factor in being able to do exactly what you were saying, Brian, the challenge is, is continue to attract the next Connell to Mines. Um, and uh, he just rolled his eyes at me, but uh, um, he, he, he's very modest, but we're, we're very lucky to have him. And we're lucky to have uh, all the students that we have here at Mines. We don't take that for, for granted. But uh, Rick, you know, admissions per team has really just cranked up uh, and really stepped up to the challenge to this. And they've They've been able to bring in great classes in times of incredible uncertainty for, for recruiting. And I don't know if you want to mention maybe a couple of the efforts that they've been doing along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say, you know, the last couple of years have been very difficult from a recruiting standpoint, but um, our, our admissions team and enrollment management group has done just a fabulous job in putting, say, Touring Minds campus online um, all kinds of uh, uh, virtual ways to interact with students and get students to look to see our campus. And they do a great job at promoting all the programs that we have. And that includes many of the things that Paul said, because we wouldn't be generating all of the student interest if students didn't feel that um, they were going to get a distinctive experience here at Mines and that they were going to be able to get rolled their sleeves and get into projects and get their hands dirty and do things like the concrete uh, canoe project or Formula One project. So there are many, many aspects that go into recruiting students. And we have a great team who goes out on the road and uh, talks to students in high schools, uh, uh, works with all of the uh, uh, counselors in high schools. And also we just recently signed an agreement with Denver Public Schools uh, 
uh, to provide a, an enhanced pathway for students to come to mines. And those are things we're continuing, continuing to do to try to uh, be able to find the best and the brightest wherever they are and have very uh, uh, easy pathways for them to come to mines, assuming that they have the, the uh, background to do so. Thanks, Rick uh, and Paul. Um, Carrie had asked about uh, increasing women enrollment across all majors. And I think uh, I, I speak for uh, my colleagues and we're really, really proud of the uh, number of women at mines. Um, the 33% of the incoming class were women. Um, and uh, they, they tend to hold a lot of the uh, leadership positions on campus. Um, it, it's just awesome to see. I don't know if uh, someone wants to add any um, more background to that, but. I, I'll just say, Brian, you know, while we're proud of the 33%, because most engineering schools are about 19, um, we're, not, we're not happy with that number. We would, we would like to be uh, approaching 40% in the classes that we're recruiting. Um, and, uh, and actually, this is another area where alumni are playing a really key role. We have a, a special alumni interest group that, that specifically is helping us to recruit women to mines. We've added new programs. Um, there's, a, there's a program called the Vanguard Scholars Program that we've added to recruit more women to mines. Um, obviously, we promote our Society of Women Engineers as the largest chapter in the nation. Um, of its of its kind, they 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 hosted their signature uh, evening with industry event last night. Um, our uh, computer science department has a has a has a special program that's specifically geared towards recruiting women into computer science field, which is a very significantly underrepresented uh, field for women. Um, so lots of, lots of work going on in the area. It, it, lots of help from student organizations, from alumni, uh, and then a, as well as our admissions team. So. We're, we're going to keep working on that one. Yeah, that, that's terrific. Yeah, Brian, the only thing I would add with that is, is that you are right. The last time I checked, um, although the women represent, let's say, 30 to 35 percent of the population on campus, by and large, over the last decade, uh, when I've looked at that, uh, I would say they disproportionately represent what we would consider uh, leadership positions uh, on the campus and various organizations at a rate of about Two thirds to three quarters in many cases in in some years, and so uh, really strong engagement um, um, by uh, women on our campus um, in positions that I think um, are are just very monumentally important to the campus, but also to uh, growth and development for all of our students. And I, I just might add one other thing that many of those women in leadership roles across campus, and even many of the the women students on campus, are assisting us in recruiting women to come to this campus and, and our vital role models to those uh, high school students who might be unsure of a, of a STEM education. And our students go out and meet with those high school students and work on recruiting events and do just a wonderful job in providing uh, a, a mentor and, um, and someone that they can look up to as, as a, a person that they could also emulate. So we're very excited about that as well. I think everyone on the call can can see that it's a it's a priority and um, we're committed to uh, continuing to uh, pursue uh, um, a, a well-balanced uh, student body um, that includes uh, uh, an increase in the number of women on campus and, and a lot of initiatives uh, there. Um, Dan, you had, had talked a, a little bit about this um, in your remarks, and, and certainly uh, Paul and Rick, you did as well. I thought maybe we'd end with uh, questions relating to the uh, MINDS signature student experience. Um, it's obviously the, the kind of the cornerstone of the MINDS at 150 strategic plan. And uh, there's a, a great question from a student, actually, Spencer, um, about um, what are we doing to uh, build a campus culture of, of, uh, of empathy and vulnerability, emotional acuity, which are the cornerstones to successful ingenuity, collaboration, uh, and so on. And, and uh, the, the signature student experience involves a, a number of different initiatives and programs um, trying to complement the fantastic technical education that students receive already. Um, so uh, uh, maybe Dan, starting with you, um, 
talk a little bit about the, the signature student experience and we'll let the rest of our colleagues kind of fill in. Sure, uh, it, it's interesting because as I mentioned before, we kind of have three prongs. One of them, um, so I have a living and learning component which dovetails very strongly with the signature student experience. They overlap in some ways, they interweave in some ways. Um, and so some of those elements, that's why I talked about the residential component as well as the well-being component. And then of course the uh, scholarship and um, professional development component. But um, one of the areas that, that I think we've really trying to facilitate that through is, is um, we, we are in the process of bringing on a position that is specifically designed to look at engagement and equity on our campus. And that's not something that we've had before um, because that will allow uh, student life to work with the institution to be able to really, really dig in and focus on that. Obviously, um, um, that was a need that we felt if we wanted to really get to those goals of what we're trying to do with, with an engaged uh, community, we needed somebody to really be able to focus predominantly on that and then lead that charge. But I will say it is something that the whole community will be a part of, right? That, that we will need everybody to have a, a role in, in, in terms of how we shape and inform and grow and evolve um, the mind's education inside the classroom as well as outside, um, and then making it distinctive. You know, I, I find that some of the things that we do, at least in student life and at the institution, aren't necessarily novel compared to the rest of the, of the country, but they're novel in the sense that the way we do it at Mines is different than other places. And it's, that's incredibly important. And I think Connell would, would attest to that in his own way. The things that he hears from his friends at other campuses, they do some of the same things. They don't do it the way we do it. And so that's, the, that's kind of the genesis for me. That's the endeavor that I start from as I work through with my staff. So I know that was a bit of ethereal, and I'm not sure if that was uh, too much all over the place. We'll see what uh, President Johnson and Rick may have to say. But that's where we're working towards in a very active way right now. So, Brian, I, I'm going to suggest the rest of us sort of defer our, our time to Connell because this has actually been a topic that's, yeah, he's, he's like, oh, gee, thanks, PCJ. But um, this is actually a topic that's been near and dear to the hearts of the student government for, for a number of years. And, and there's, there, we have student organizations that are dedicated to trying to provide a more inclusive and empathetic campus to things. And so I, I'm, I'm curious if, if he could give us sort of a short synopsis of, of what he sees from, from his perspective and his friends. So just talking about like the resources on campus of showing empathy, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, like some of the student groups, like you know, random acts of kindness. You know, we've got things there that are sort of built into the culture to try to to, yeah. to help everybody out, right? No, definitely. You know, there's a bunch of resources that are available to make sure students stay connected with uh, other students as well as faculty. Um, the next push I'd say for undergraduate student government and for students in general is like, we're very good at pointing out resources that are given to us from administration uh, to support us. But I'd really like to see the student body try to be that support immediately for students that need it. Show the empathy and show the resolve and the resolution um, to support one another without having to refer other students to resources. Um, I think that falls really in line with like uh, ore diggers climb together and no ore digger left behind. As ore diggers, we work together, we watch each other's backs. And so that would be the next thing is just how can we continue to support each other without having to divert us to differing resources? So the research, the number one resource, I guess I'm saying should be students. Um, and then administrative resources that are available to us. But Connell, I, I suspect a lot of our alums would agree with you 100% because I, I have heard uh, in my time here at Mines so many stories from alums who, who will say, I only made it through Mines because of this person or that person. It's, it's usually somebody they went to school with um, or maybe it was a coach or, or whatever that, that got them through. And, and that it's, that, it's that personal connection um, that helps helps with that resilience and everything else that's necessary uh, to make it through. So, great. So, Brian, you going to wrap up? Yes, I'll I'll wrap up. Uh, got some um, information up on the screen. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and thanks certainly to 
um, my uh, fellow panelists. Um, really appreciate their uh, time and insight and, and sharing all that's going on at Mines. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, we've got a lot going on at Mines, and uh, an hour probably doesn't do it justice um, for all the cool stuff. Um, and I, I'm sure you can tell, you know, our faculty and staff are exceptional. Uh, and, and certainly Connell exemplifies uh, that our students are tremendous and are continuing a legacy established by Mines alum, alumni. They're intellectually curious, they're problem solvers, they demonstrate grit and resilience. Um, and uh, we're, we're just really proud of them and, and pleased to be able to, uh, to support them and uh, what they want out of their Mines experience. Um, I will say to all the alums out there, Minds is building off the, the great past um, that you established, the, the foundations. Um, and uh, we're still um, all about engineering and applied science. We're about getting stuff done. We're about solving problems. Um, and uh, I, I think as, as Dan mentioned, you know, continuing to get involved, we'd love to have you on campus um, mentoring. Uh, supporting events. Um, come see what's going on on campus. Uh, it's a special place um, and uh, we want you to be a part of it. Um, you know, obviously Minds can't do all of this uh, relying solely on tuition or state support. Uh, private support is the margin of excellence, which we seek. Uh, and so in addition to encouraging you to get involved, uh, we encourage you to support Minds in a way that's meaningful to you. There's so many worthwhile programs at Mines that would benefit from your support. Um, and so uh, we, we encourage you to, to find something that is uh, really exciting to you. There's plenty of it at Mines. Um, so check out the website, weare.mines.edu for more information about the campaign for Mines at 150 and for volunteer opportunities. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at homecoming or uh, another event on campus. And once again, thank you all for joining us.